the shooting range. In this episode, Pages of History, Enigmatic Pilot, Special New Map Tour, and Metal Beasts, Beefy Howitzer. The La Royale update will become available to all players pretty soon, which means that it's time to meet the new vehicles. We've picked a pretty beefy machine to start with. Actually, it's not just a beefy machine. It's the true embodiment of power for the real Tigers of War Thunder. Please welcome the AU-F1, a French self-propelled howitzer based on the AMX-30. Let's take a closer look. Its main caliber is a 155 mm howitzer with elevation angles between minus 4 and plus 66 degrees. The turret is also equipped with a large caliber machine gun and smoke launchers. The engine and transmission compartment is in the rear, the driver sits in the front, and three more crew members are in the turret. The ammo racks are found in the rear of the combat compartment. The usage of this machine is pretty simple and very similar to other HE slingers. Roll this chonker out and send a 155mm shell at the enemy. After that, you… no, you don't retreat, of course. After that, you make a quick, aggressive pounce with your rear towards the nearest cover and reload. Thanks to the autoloader, your gun will be ready for another shot in only 7.5 seconds. Moreover, the first stage of the ammo rack might last an entire round. With a rate of fire this high, you can quickly switch between shell types. Type number one is simple. It's a classic high explosive with almost 7 kilograms of TNT. We recommend you keep it as your main one since it has 54 millimeters of penetration, enough to crush pretty much any vehicle's roof, and a muzzle velocity of 810 meters per second, which provides excellent ballistics. Shell number two is another HE with 9 kilograms of TNT equivalent and a proximity fuse. It's amazing against enemy air and useful against ground vehicles hiding behind some cover. All you need to do is aim your shell somewhere above the opponent's roof, and the proximity fuse will do the rest. The AUF-1's mobility is also a joy. It can offer you 17 horsepower per ton, which admittedly is nowhere near a record but enough to keep up with the main forces of your team. After all, it's better to be the last among the first than the first among the last. By the way, this French vehicle's transmission allows it to achieve its top speed in both forward and reverse. Now, survivability is barely present here. You could say the AUF isn't afraid of backstabbing, as long as the stabbing happens to someone else's back. Because its rear is an enormous rack with 42 155mm high explosive shells, and all those goodies are covered with only 20mm of armor. So you gotta do what you gotta do, meaning avoid enemy rounds at all costs. Anyway, the AUF is most enjoyable in a pack of reliable teammates. Does it matter who's in your sights? What matters is who covers your flank. It's also much more fun when you've got someone to share the hunt with. Yes, the Sturm Tiger is still the King HE Slinger, but the AUF is certainly making it uncomfortable on its throne. Have you ever encountered anything you couldn't explain? How about something in your daily life where you least expect it? If your answer is no, this story might become your first such experience. Here's the IL-2, the most mass-produced combat aircraft in history. Right below it is Königsberg, a heavily fortified Nazi sector recently taken by the Soviet Army. The plane is piloted by Georgi Parshin, the commander of a strike aviation regiment twice awarded the title of the hero of the Soviet Union. He would usually fly a different IL-2, his personal one, with decorations dedicated to previous battles, but let's imagine he's piloting a less remarkable aircraft at this moment. 
What could be said about this person? Receiving the highest distinction twice makes you a hero even among heroes. Tens of millions took part in that war, but less than a hundred managed to get the Gold Star Medal twice. People like that are always in the center of attention. History would probably write down everything about them. Or just about everything, right? Well, all you can find about Parshin is short, dry reports and a couple of feature stories. Even those who encountered him personally during the war didn't have much to say for some reason. Like, yeah, there was this guy, an amazing pilot and a great commander, fought in the war from day one all the way to the end, made more than 200 sorties on the IL-2, destroyed countless German vehicles and personnel. Once he got hit himself and crashed inside enemy territory, but managed to get back through the front lines with a group of scouts he met and even brought back a captive, unfortunately, he didn't get to enjoy his life for very long after the war. In 1956, he died while test piloting the IL-28 bomber. And that's about it. This short report does a very poor job at painting a picture. There's so much stuff that isn't going to be written about Parshian. A whole lot of stories that are passed along generations of aviation people quickly turning into legends. Back in 1941 and 1942, Parshin, then a first lieutenant, made quite a few sorties on the Leningrad front. The all-powerful German Luftwaffe believed they had achieved air superiority, so no one would dare attack them. But Parshin must have missed that part of the briefing, as he saw a different picture. He was almost invincible and daringly efficient. Some said he could have a single look at the topography map and reach a target at an ultra-low altitude following only his memory. More than that, he could bring with him a whole squadron in a tight formation. To make things even more unbelievable, he could do it in the worst possible weather, weather so bad that German pilots wouldn't even think about climbing into their Messerschmitts. The stories also note that Parshin didn't really need aerial surveillance, since he would often find major targets on his own successfully destroying them by himself or bringing his squadron along. When Parshin was asked how he found well-disguised enemy tanks, artillery positions, and warehouses, he'd say, they fear us, just follow the fear. Of course, we can't vouch if those words were truly his or if they're just another legend, but one fact remains true. Georgi Parshin was incredibly efficient and his numerous victories have been confirmed with photo evidence. Speaking of victories, by the end of the war, the Major had downed 10 German planes, most of them fighters. He engaged them on his IL-2, and his gun camera recorded him destroying Messerschmitts and Focke Wolf planes, so there's no doubt about that. Now, why did no one write or speak much about Major Parshin besides the formal minimum? Maybe his talent felt a bit too extraordinary for comfort. While other famous IL-2 aces like Nelson Stepanyan, Vasily Andrianov, and Talgat Begeldinov are widely known, Major Parshin mostly stayed in the shadows. Could that be the reason? Well, there's no way to find out. And thus, his personal IL-2, tail number 94, flies over captured Königsberg. Its hull is decorated with revenge and for Leningrad inscriptions. They're there, all right. We just can't see them for some reason because that's just the kind of pilot in that plane. The La Royale update is bringing a new ground forces map, the Iberian Castle. We'd like to give you our traditional welcome tour around it to help you better navigate the landscape and find your way faster along the unknown roads full of enemies. This location is inspired by tiny tourist towns scattered along the coast of the Balearic Sea. Our trip begins in the southwestern part of the map, where we can find the main site of this area, an ancient castle built on a tall rock right above the water. Most of the fortifications are in poor condition, but the ruins can still give you the impression of how strong and majestic this castle looked centuries ago. It still protects you well against hits from above, by the way. There's no climbing to the main towers on the rock, too many boulders in the way. Even if someone feels extra skilled at mountaineering, the edge of the map is a reliable guard here. The battle will take place among the wall ruins here, and inside we can find point C. 
You can get to it while avoiding enemy contact, but once you're inside the capture area, there's no hiding. Only a few buildings can be used as cover, so don't expect to capture this area in a sneaky way. Let's move on to the center of the map. Between the outermost wall and the modern town, we can see the central point. It offers a bit more cover, but still leaves some options for flanking. So you might want to keep an eye on all the approaches to the capture area. Moving further, we find ourselves in a tiny tourist town with typical Mediterranean architecture. Small houses with terracotta roof shingles, numerous arches, summer terraces, and cozy narrow streets promise you some shade and a rest. Still, you shouldn't relax too much here since each turn might be hiding an enemy ready to strike, and good asphalt accommodates quick sorties into the enemy territory. Once you're in an urban environment, you should stay alert. Listen for engine noise on neighboring streets, and look at your map so that you don't take another infiltrator for an ally. Outside of town, in an old mansion, we can find point A. It offers a few buildings as cover for tankers capping this area, but no good view at the approaches. Too many fences and greenery in the way. Further northeast, we can see the plantations going all the way to the edge of the map. Vineyards pose no trouble for armored vehicles, but olive gardens can easily make you feel lost. Besides, the lush trees limit your view and force you to use your optics all the time to check if that flash ahead was an enemy machine. The new location for mixed battles is pretty large, picturesque, and in places tricky to navigate. Share your impressions and tactical ideas in the comments as soon as you test it. We're looking forward to it. And now it's time for us to answer some of the questions you asked us in the comments. The first question was sent by a player called Marquez Rios. Add the Heinkel 111Z in War Thunder. It's a conjoined bomber connected to another Heinkel 111. Hello, Marquez. It sure is an interesting plane, but it's only ever been used to tow cargo gliders. The game simply can't offer a purpose for this machine. Katyusha Gaming asked, What's the best Soviet torpedo bomber? Hi there. There's only a handful of torpedo bombers in the Soviet tech tree, so your choice is pretty narrow. We think that the best are the Catalina, for its torpedoes, and the BE-6, for its overall performance. By the way, the BE-6 is receiving its custom loadout capability in the next update, so you'll be able to take both torpedoes and bombs at the same time. Another question comes from Pan Bersik. Why is the F-16 so slow compared to other top fighters? Hi, Pan. Well, we wouldn't say it's slow. The F-16's acceleration and top speed are on par with other top fighters. Here's a demonstration. Luftpanzerwaffe writes, Do the KA-50 Black Shark and KA-52 Alligator have ejector seats in War Thunder? And if not, you need to add them. Hi there. They're actually almost there. Just wait a few more days. Ejecting from a helicopter is much harder than from a plane, of course, but our artists did their best to create the animations for these unique processes. And the last comment for today was written by Maria Heider. What do you think is the best loadout for the F4S Phantom? Hi, Maria. You know, we think the Phantoms deserve their own arsenal section. We'll tell you all you need to know about the best loadouts on this aircraft. That's it for today. You've been watching The Shooting Range by Gaijin Entertainment, and the next episode will premiere the following Sunday at 4 p.m. GMT or noon Eastern Time. Subscribe and click the bell if you don't want to miss our next videos. Don't forget to pet and exercise your chonky, leave a like, share your thoughts and comments, and see you next week.